evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and, and welcome to um, what I hope will be an extraordinary evening and a very surprising evening, despite it naturally beginning on a disappointing note, and that is that Christopher isn't physically with us. You'd be pleased to know that he is actually um, watching this event. Um, and uh, he will be very pleased to hear that. With him is his wife, Carol, and uh, one of his great friends, Ian McEwan, the novelist, uh, amongst his many, many features. One of them is a genius for friendship, as we will discover. Um, but I'm delighted to welcome you all to the um, South Bank Centre's Royal Festival Hall here. Um, you will be, I'll tell you who you'll be hearing from, um, and it won't surprise you if you know anything about Christopher. You'll be hearing from Martin Amis. You'll be hearing, yes, the man himself. You'll be hearing from Christopher Buckley, from James Fenton, from Salman Rushdie. Um, and here in this theatre, I'll be talking to Emeritus Professor Richard Dawkins. And uh, there's a very exciting 11th hour edition uh, a remarkable man, a remarkable artist, a remarkable actor who's a huge, huge admirer of Christopher, as I can tell everyone in this room is. And we're hoping, uh, through the joys of Google Plus Hangout, to have a conversation with Sean Penn. So, first of all, I've just got a few words to say about Christopher Eric Hitchens. Yes, his middle name really is Eric. Um, maybe a comic name to us now, but um, it's A was the name of his father, and B, of course, was the first name of a writer, polemicist, essayist, and political thinker uh, on whom Christopher has written a book and uh, from whom he can rightly claim descendancy and influence. Eric Blair, whose pen name, of course, was George Orwell. You can call Christopher Hitch, you might call him The Hitch. You can address him as Mr. Hitchens um, or Christopher. But if you wish to emerge from his presence unscathed, don't even think of calling him Chris. I have to explain why it's me here, why it is I here introducing this evening, um, an evening during which Christopher and I were scheduled to shoot the breeze, him in, in, in Washington DC and myself here. I can't claim to call him a um, friend with anything like the depth of meaning that several of the people we're going to hear from this evening can, but I can at least claim the privilege of having debated with him by his side at Hay on Y and um, uh, here in London for Intelligence Squared. And, and I can claim too that we call each other old horse like Stanley Eukridge or old crumpet like Barney Phipps or Ufi Prosser, um, for we share a love and a great passion for the works of P.G. Woodhouse and such things form a bond. The first thing I want to disabuse you of is the notion that Christopher is an earnest um, and humorless political and, 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 and utterly sanctimonious figure as he is sometimes painted. He has fought for all kinds of causes all his life. He has stood up against bullies. He has outraged those who assumed he was a natural ally. He has poured all his energies, talents, and enthusiasms in a thousand directions, but always, always with wit, with panache, with a sumptuously exquisite use of language, with a deep understanding that the connection between style and substance is absolute. A true thing, badly expressed, is a lie. Christopher has opened up debate, given voice to ideas and causes that without his talents would have been less ventilated and less understood. He has done so from a position of learning and understanding that earns the accolade, no matter how unloved and forlorn it is in Anglo-Saxon nations, of intellectual. Like me, he's Jewish on his mother's side, the side that counts. Um, like me, he's busy and productive, but unlike me, he is not a cheap whore. <laughs> well, I thank you for that applause. Um, I say that, I'm actually quite an expensive whore, and 
I like to think I'm a good whore, um, <laughs> because I kiss. Um, <laughs> but I am... <laughs> I am way out of Christopher's major league. Almost everybody is. Uh, it's no accident that the great associations in his life, um, um, uh, um, uh, of which he was at the absolute center, um, of one of the most remarkable, talented, and tight circle of friends in British cultural life for the last 50 years, who are all distinguished, not only by their supreme intelligence, their speed of wit, uh, their range of learning and breadth of knowledge, but also quite simply, at the very level of the sentence, by their miraculous ability to put one word after another uh, in the service of poetry, the essay, the novel, criticism, story, or political screed. Certainly he was a committed traveler, protester, pamphleteer, propagandist for the far left, a Trotskyist, an international brigadier of the old school, um, traveling from Cyprus to Cambodia, from Cuba to Paris, a, a soissant huitard, an old-fashioned hard left, Bolshe dissident and dissenter. Yet somehow, Christopher has emerged, I won't say as the most important member of that group, but that would be a meaninglessly cheap and pointless thing to say, but um, as a very, very surprisingly influential and important figure of our times. He has become, in the words of Willie Loman, someone of a cunt. He's, he's torn into sacred cows like Mother Teresa and Princess Diana. He's horrified many of his apparently natural liberal left allies with his attacks on Clinton, his fervent support for the war in Iraq, and he's risen to the top of many little black books of revenge thanks to his bravura attacks on religionists, spiritual snake oil salesmen, established churches. But risen, he certainly has, to a point of fame, adulation, and attention that I think has surprised no one more than himself. So what we're here, perhaps most of all, to celebrate is that someone in this cultural desert of celebrity worship, counter-enlightenment malice, and revealed scripture tyranny, someone has shown that there is still in this world, especially amongst the intelligent and curious young, a furious appetite for ideas, for knowledge, for thought, and for the questioning of authority. For being, in a word from one of his best books, a contrarian. In that sense, Christopher Hitchens can rightly be described as a hero. Not of the left or of the neocon right, not of libertarianism or of liberal humanism, but a hero of the mind. Well, he's certainly my hero, and thanks to technology, we will now be able to hear, I hope, I very much hope, we'll be able to hear from others who admire him too. And um, so I'm going to go and sit in that chair there and pray that the might of Google has allowed a miracle to take place. So watch me pace. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, look, there's Sean. Hooray! Sean Penn, welcome, and um, thank you very much for joining us. Can you hear clearly? Thank you. Yes, I hear you fine. Fantastic. Um, I, I know it's morning in Los Angeles where you are, um, and as you know, it's evening and the night is closing in in London. And, um, I know you admire Christopher Hitchens enormously, and there are many, many reasons why one might. And I believe, <laughs> I believe that one of the reasons you admire him is, um, is for the extraordinary, if you like, ferocity and ultimately validated truth of his attack on one of the most powerful men in American history, and that is uh, Henry Kissinger. Is that, is that how you first came across Christopher, as a, as a polemicist who attacked Kissinger? Yes, it was his book, The Trials of Henry Kissinger, that really uh, focused my attention on his work and then followed also by a kind of the magnific magnificence of his language was, is, is a, I think, particular inspiration to those of us in America who have undervalued it. And then the clarity of his thought, um, I think, made him a particular, um, particularly sharp knife in the cutting of Kissinger, who I think the original title of the book in Chris's mind was Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, but that, that was not um, appreciated by publishers. 
but I think what Kissinger was confronted with, with, with Christopher Hitchens, was somebody who was, was not uh, uh, distracted by a, uh, the intelligence of Kissinger or his articulation, because Chris could more than match it and had a clarity of, of, of a kind of pure and, and uh, unencumbered morality that saw what Kissinger's motivations were in a way that was um, unequivocal. Yes, and of course, Kissinger attempted to sue Christopher, didn't he? And um, that turned out, we are so pleased to see you smoking, by the way. It is, um, it's, it's a magnificent sight. It would be far less shocking to most audiences if you took your penis out on stage. So, um, uh, congratulations for doing that. And uh, Christopher um, is more than a rhetorician. He does have to do that thing. And this is one of the reasons I admire him. He has to do that thing called work, where you actually have to find out facts. You have to rootle around, and you have to get them right, because the cost of getting them wrong is enormous, uh, especially in America. It's a lawsuit. Uh, it's a lawsuit that can ruin you. And um, the side of Christopher that perhaps people don't understand, uh, because it's the side they naturally never see, they see, um, they see the, 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 the famous, slightly shambling, drinker and smoker um, who adorned so many um, platforms and made so many debates and, and, and was so extraordinary in his ability to speak perfectly um, without notes. Was so absolutely unbeatable in debate, possibly um, the greatest debater since Demosthenes. Um, and what, what they don't see is, is, is the man alone in his library um, or the man chasing sources the man making sure that every word he writes is not only beautifully written, but is beautifully researched. And, and that, is, that is why books like the Kissinger book still bear reading time and time again, because they're kind of unarguable. Amongst the causes for which he is known, there is one, perhaps, which springs m most readily to people's lips. Um, and that is, um, that is, if you like, the, he noticed before many of us did that the tide of the Enlightenment was being rolled back quite deliberately. And so he is very well known for, amongst other things, his extraordinary book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. And perhaps the best known, um, uh, even better known than Christopher for such a thing, is the Emeritus Professor for the Understanding of Science from Oxford University, who, let us not forget, it is one of the great evolutionary biologists of his day, and I'm about to introduce him on stage now, Professor Richard Dawkins, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> well, Richard, in a sense, would it be fair to say that that your anger at religion is not so much uh, it, it, the, the prime cause of your life, it's just simply that you found it was getting in the way of, of, a, of a free education, of, of free thinking. Yes, I, I think my, my anger, probably like Christopher's, is somewhat exaggerated, and it's exaggerated because people who are very devoted to religion, uh, when they hear any kind of criticism, however mild, they think it's angry. I think the re reason is they're so unused to it uh, that even a relatively mild criticism, a criticism that would sound mild if it was a criticism of a piece of theater or a restaurant or something, if it's religion, it sounds angry. Yeah. Um, so I think that's exaggerated. I mean, I, to the extent that I am angry, um, I think possibly m my anger would be slightly different from Christopher's in that he, I suppose is angry because he sees the tyrannical God figure as a sort of dictator, a kind of um, uh, North Korea um, yes. horror figure. So it's um, at peace with his political he, thinking. He, he, I'm sort of guessing there, whereas in my case, I think it's sort of educational. I, I feel that the subversion of young minds, teaching them the, the second-rate explanation for the existence of themselves and the universe, as opposed to the real one, given that the real one is so enthralling and fascinating. Mm. Um, it's just uh, so tawdry and so second-rate to fob them off with supernaturalism. 
So that, that, if, to the extent that I am angry, um, that's probably the main source of it. Yeah, it was surprisingly, I think it was Yasser Arafat who said that the history of most of the wars of the world is quarrels over whose invisible friend was more powerful. Yes. <laughs> that's right. I suppose you will continue to get hate mail. I know Christopher has had the weird experience of having to decide which is weirder, the, the people who are praying for him. Um, not, not necessarily even to get better, but to find faith um, in, in his moment of, of, of physical illness, or those who are gloating that he will roast for eternity in hell. I think they're about equal yeah. in, in, in numbers, aren't they? I wonder whether when they say, I'll pray for you, he gives that wonderful reply, I'll think for you. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. We have now someone who is um, uh, of a kind of um, um, great dynasty uh, in America. His father is probably well known as one of the most conservative um, spokesmen and figures of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, particularly famous for his coming to blows with um, Gore Vidal on many occasions on television. And his son has turned out to be one of the great comic writers of his time and had a bit of a falling out with his beloved father, although they have different political persuasions. He, he wrote a famous essay saying something, I think it was called something like, sorry, dad, but I'm voting for Obama. Um, and he's a friend of Christopher's and he's a, he's a quite... Um, quite wonderful writer, um, uh, in, in a common theme uh, for the evening from the great smoker Christopher Hitchens to the great smoker, as we now know, Sean Penn, um, we come to the author of Thank You for Smoking, Christopher Buckley. Hello, Christopher. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Stephen. Hello, London. And hello, Christopher. Uh, now, you, you know something about the, um, the world of um, uh, doctrinal politics in America better than most because, as I say, you come from a family, uh, your father was a, was a very well-known, very well-respected, um, also very well-feared uh, spokesman for the right, um, and um, his name forever coupled with um, Gore Vidal's as, as jousting uh, through, through the 60s. And you yourself um, have, have been a, a much gentler figure, um, but you like Christopher, and I think it's a side that I want to reiterate about Christopher, um, are a, a comic writer. I mean, Christopher is one of the wittiest writers in English, as well as sometimes one of the most savage. Um, would, would you agree with that? I, uh, I, would, I would absolutely agree with that. I, as a footnote, uh, it was my father, who I believe gave Christopher his first um, exposure on American television. And uh, three years ago, Christopher made uh, a heroic effort to attend my father's funeral mass at St. Patrick's. He flew in from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, I think grabbed the last seat, but then found himself in the awkward position of uh, uh, being in the, in the uh, same church uh, as Henry Kissinger, who was one of the other <laughs> eulogists at my father's funeral mass. So he, uh, he records in his marvelous book, Hitch 22, how he ducked out onto, the, onto a rain-swept Fifth Avenue to have a cigarette so that he would not be counted as having been among Henry Kissinger's <laughs> audience. <laughs> I suppose part of the um, p part of the, the splendor of Christopher's life is the way he mixes friendship with politics. Um, considering he was someone of the hard left, the hard left were always uh, were always taken to be those figures who could weep for the masses but had no ability, as it were, to care for individuals. Where he was never like that. Do you think there is a word for Christopher's politics? Well, uh, they, uh, Christopher, uh, when I first knew him in the early 80s, when he came down to Washington in, uh, to cover the Falklands crisis, I was working for 
as a speechwriter for George Herbert Walker Bush, or the good Bush, as, <laughs> uh, as he is known, I think, over there. And Christopher, at that time, was a very hard leftist. He, he wrote for uh, all the, uh, all the, the very left-wing publications. He was a correspondent for The Nation. And, uh, but he has such a supple and, uh, uh, with a bow to Professor Dawkins, if I may use the term, evolutionary mind, that he made a, uh, a rather interesting trajectory uh, through the years, uh, so that he, 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 he became, uh, in the early part of the last decade of, of the last century, one of, the, one of the great proponents of U.S. military invention in Iraq. Uh, it's been uh, it's it, it's been uh, it, it's been quite a quite a quite a spectacle to watch. But Christopher has has never no one would ever accuse him of having been dull. Yes, usually he, when uh, I, if I if I yeah. may say he uh, uh, Christopher was the Rick Blaine of Washington. <laughs> uh, I refer, of course, to the Humphrey Bogart character in the movie Casablanca. Everyone went to the hitches. Yes. He famously, in the, uh, I guess it was the first years of the Clinton administration, threw a party at his flat uh, over uh, in, in Washington for after the White House correspondence dinner. And it became the, it was the Vanity Fair party. Uh, and everyone came. Uh, and it got so big after two or three years that it had to move to a rather interesting venue right directly across the street, the Russian Trade Federation building, <laughs> so you, you could, which was an odd place to have a Rick's Cafe. But uh, you, uh, I, I mean, everyone came. I, uh, on one memor memorable occasion, I, I got to, uh, Barbara Streisand caught fire. <laughs> uh, quite literally, by standing a little bit too uh, close to a to a candle, and she really uh, the world was on the verge of, of losing Barbara Streisand. <laughs> Miss Streisand's politics and my own are, are very uh, divergent, or perhaps discrepant, to use a uh, Hitchensian word. But uh, I was I was one of the first responders uh, in the in the Barbara Streisand self immolation. <laughs> so that's my little footnote in history. <laughs> we have many other reasons to thank you, Christopher, but it's been extremely enjoyable. And, and thank you for taking the time. And um, bless you. And bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to, um, I'm going to do my best to check to see. Um, without giving away too many secrets, you know how how technically advanced um, Christopher and his wife are by the fact that they both have an AOL address. Um, <laughs> I know. It's just talk about, it's like Lady Bracknell, the unfashionable side of the square. Um, I tried to persuade uh, Blue, who's Carol, uh, Carol who is, who is um, Hitch's wife, to see if she could um, uh, use uh, an instant messaging system. Uh, they don't seem to have managed to do that. She did say she might even try and text me. So we'll see if we've got any words of wisdom yet from here on my, on my thing here. Um, uh, oh, hello. Yes. Actually, she's chosen an email, which is really clever of her. Um, <laughs> we've, got, we've got contributions here. Let the games begin. It starts. <laughs> Uh, and these, these are actually being uh, typed by Ian McEwan because apparently his fingers are better. Um, <laughs> so, he, um, and uh, we get, uh, uh, this is from Ian. I talked until late last night with Hitch. We were discussing the non-communist left of the early 50s. He can't run a mile just now, but be reassured the Rolls-Royce mind is purring smoothly. Which is a very good line there from Ian McEwan. Now I'm going to introduce someone who I, I've admired and I wish I could say I knew. I know him through his poetry. I think um, we are lucky to be living in a time when there are still great poets. Seamus Heaney is still with us. And I do believe that the greatest English poet alive is James Fenton. Um, he is simply remarkable. If you don't know his work, it is the most, it's as accessible as Philip Larkin, as deep as Eliot or 
uh, any poet you wish it to be. It's as long-lasting and as refreshing to the mind as poetry can be. It is absolutely perfect. He has been one of Christopher's closest friends for the longest possible time since their Oxford days as undergraduates. And he is in New York, so we want to say hello, if we can, to James Fenton. Hello. Hello. James, I've, I'm, I've, I've spoken a little about the extraordinary sodality, the, um, the, the group that you form with Martin and Ian and uh, Clive James um, and Salman and Christopher, a group of friends who've stayed together um, in a way that is really quite extraordinarily inspiring. I wish I could say I knew anyone of my generation who had an equivalent. And it's not only the strength of your friendship, it is also the quite astounding depth of all of your individual talents. When this evening was planned and, and Christopher knew that he wasn't going to be able to take part, one of the things that he was very excited about was the possibility of you reading a, a poem. And I know we'd uh, all love to hear that. And, um, yes. Which one have you chosen? Yeah, and you suggested it as The Skip? The Skip, which is the one of my favourites. Is, is the one that Christopher suggested. Good. Well, we'd love to hear it. Well, um, then I'll read it. And I'll just say, before I do so, what I always say in America, I know that um, I'm talking to you in England, but uh, in America we say that a skip is a, a, a dumpster. The skip. I, I took my life and threw it on the skip reckoning the next-door neighbours wouldn't mind if my life hitched a lift to the council tip with their dry rot and rubble. What you find with skips is the whole community joins in. Old mattresses appear. Doors kind of drift along with all that won't fit in the bin and stuff the binmen can't be fished to shift. I threw away my life and there it lay and grew quite sodden. What a dreadful shame, clucked some old bag and sucked her teeth. The way the young these days, no values, me, I blame. But I blamed no one. Quality control had loused it up, and that was that. Enough said. I couldn't stick at home. I took a stroll and passed the skip and left my life for dead. Without my life, the beer was just as foul the landlord, still as filthy as his wife. The chicken in the basket was an owl. And no one said, he, Jim lad, worth the life. Well, I got back that night, the worse for wear, but still just capable of single vision. Looked in the skip, <coughs> my life, it wasn't there. Some bugger nicked it without my permission. OK, so I got angry and began to shout and woke the street. OK, OK. And I was sick all down the neighbour's van. And I disgraced myself on the parquet. And then, you know how, if you've had a few, you'll wake at dawn all healthy like sea breezes, raring to go and thinking, clever you, you got away with it. And then, oh Jesus, it hits you. Well, that morning... Just at six, I woke, got up, and looked down at the skip. There lay my life, still sodden on the bricks. There lay my poor old life, arse over tip. Or was it mine? Still dressed, I went downstairs and took a long, cool look. The truth was dawning. Someone had just exchanged my life for theirs. Poor fool, I thought. I should have left a warning. Some bastard saw my life and thought it nicer than what he'd had. Yet what he'd had seemed fine. He never caught his fingers in the slicer the way I'd managed with that life of mine. His life lay glistening in the rain, <coughs> neglected, but still a decent and authentic life. Some people I can think of, I reflected, <coughs> would take that thing as soon as you'd say knife. It seemed a shame to miss a chance like that. I brought the life in, dried it by the stove. 
It looked so fetching, stretched out on the mat. I tried it on. It fitted like a glove. And now, when some local bat drops off the twig, and new folk take the house and pull up floors and knock down walls and hire some kind of big container, say, a skip for their old doors, <coughs> I'll watch it like a hawk, and every day I'll make at least, oh, half a dozen trips. I've furnished an existence in that way. You'd not believe the things you find on skips. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, James Fenton. The wonderful James Fenton. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Now, the person we're next going to speak to is, in my opinion, um, aside from being a, um, a really great writer, I think his place in Christopher's life may be an explanation for some of the, some of the ways that Christopher's politics changed. Um, and, and that is the man he defended so brilliantly when quite equally shamefully so many on the left refused to come forward and defend him. And that is the man who for years had to hide with a threat of death on him for writing a book. A book which, if you haven't gone back to reread it, is a marvelous, marvelous novel. He continues to write marvelous novels. He continues to be the one and only Salman Rushdie. Hello, Salman. Hey. Hello, Stephen. Hello, Richard. <laughs> and hello, Christopher. It's, it's wonderful to see you here. There's a, um, as um, and not making this an Oxford and Cambridge fight, because, of course, um, Christopher was both having gone to school in Cambridge and then university in Oxford, but there's a Cambridge tradition which is very mocked by the hard left which might be said to be represented by the philosopher G. E. Moore and by the Bloomsbury Group, and, and in particular by the writer E. M. Forster, and that is the cult of personal relations. And there's a famous line of Forster's, which mm -hmm. is, if it came to a choice between betraying my friend or betraying my country, I hope I would have the guts to betray my country. And that, if you like, was the starting point of that cult of personal relations, as you know. And I've often wondered that if the satanic verses had been written by someone who wasn't an incredibly close friend of Christopher, do you think he would have been activated in quite the way he was? In other words, was your friendship a part of, you know, a part of a proof that he wasn't all hard left, that there was a part of him that was also just a little bit Bloomsbury? You know, I, I think probably he'd have reacted exactly the same way, because I, I think what, um, what got up his nose uh, was the idea that, uh, you know, a, a, an aged prelate in an, in an antique land could sentence to death uh, a writer across the world um, for the crime of writing a book. I think it just uh, was something he couldn't countenance. And, but I do think that what happened then was that his friendship with me drove him to become the most extraordinary ally um, and helper in those hard times. Uh, I mean, I remember when after many years or many, well, a very long period of effort, uh, we managed to arrange, partly with Christopher's help, um, a meeting with President Clinton. I actually was staying at Christopher's house, left from Christopher's house, to go to the, the meeting, um, which was on the day before Thanksgiving. And on the day before Thanksgiving, the President of the United States always has to ceremonially pardon a turkey. Yes. One turkey. Tom the turkey is pardoned. All the others are killed. And, <laughs> and I was going to be seeing Clinton immediately before the pardoning of the turkey. And so we imagined <laughs> the possible headline of the newspapers the next day which was, um, which was that Clinton pardons Turkey, Rushdie gets stuffed. <laughs> um, however, as it happens, the meeting was quite successful. And I remember that George Stephanopoulos, then an aide of Clinton's, who had been very helpful, was so excited when the meeting took place that he called Christopher at his house and said, the eagle has landed. <laughs> and, 
So Christopher was very, very much at the heart of that struggle. And I've always been, I've been grateful to him, is understating what I feel. And, and also, his fury was not just um, towards, towards, as you rightly say, an aging cleric in an antique land, but also towards quite a, a startling number of writers in Britain and America who were very lax in coming forward in what seems to me so clear-cut a case. Um, there were people who said, oh, I've read the book and don't think it's very good, as if that might be a reason why you should be killed. Um, <laughs> there, were, there were others who said that because you were yourself of a left, left inclination, it was an outrage that the police should defend you. Um, it, it, and I think it, it was as oh. much the, his fury at, 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 at the lack of defense from others as as from the fact by itself. Is, is that a fair analysis? Yeah, I think that's so. I think that's so. But uh, I mean, for, for me, the, just the main memory of those years is that, um, is that Christopher was always there when I needed him. You know, one of the things I learned in those years is, that, is the meaning of a friend in need, you know? And Christopher was a, you know, transcendent example of that. He was there for whenever I needed him for whatever I needed him for. And uh, if we can, uh, if, if we that can was just to do both with his principles mm -hmm. and the way in which he felt those principles were offended by the attack on, on my book, uh, but also by his, you know, as we know from his memoir, his enormous gift for personal friendship. Exactly. And I was going to return to his memoir, Hitch 22. Um, when he first, as it were, introduces you, um, um, it might come as a surprise to those who don't have the privilege of knowing you, um, that w almost the first thing that impressed you, impressed him about you was your facility with words and the fun and games you had with words. Can you take us through some of those, some of your particular uh, games that you used to play? Well, well Christopher, you know, is a very funny man and, and, and we did invent one or two sort of ridiculous word games. Well, the, perhaps the one I could share with you um, is the one about um, titles that don't quite make it. And um, examples of this would be um, A Farewell to Weapons, or <laughs> For Whom the Bell Rings, or <laughs> Mr. Zhivago, you know, you know, uh, to, kill a humming, to, you know to Kill a Hummingbird, um, you know, the, 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 catcher in, the Catcher in the Wheat. Um, <laughs> Melville's great masterpiece, Toby Dick, <laughs> <laughs> etc. This is <isn't>, <laughs> uh, these were games that we played. Martin had a Martin and he had a more obscene game, but uh, but there was there was there, well there was the game about hysterical sex where you replace the word love in the titles of things with the phrase hysterical sex. <laughs> that gives you hysterical sex in the time of cholera. <laughs> uh, hysterical sex is a many splendid thing. <laughs> All you need is hysterical sex. <laughs> and so on. These were the. the Absolutely wonderful. It's these fabulous. were the same games we played. Thank you, Salman Rusty. Thank you so much. Oh, well. Thank you. <laughs> well, there you are, you see. This is fun to be had. It is. Um, it is an extraordinary thought, isn't it, that all those people, those young people, I mean, not one of them, <laughs> not one of them uh, a, a, a leader in their, in their field, and novelists and... I, I love those word games, and another one that I remember they, they played was to substitute the word dick for heart, so, my dick is like a red, red rose. <laughs> <laughs> Very pleasing. <laughs> Will you be my sweet dick? Yes. Um, when I yes. talk, um, I think... I hope straight away, um, to uh, the centre of the sodality, um, at least uh, um, uh, according to James Fenton. And that is um, one of the great novelists of our times, uh, also a great essayist of our times, um, and um, um, of course one of Christopher's greatest friends, Martin Amis. Are you there, Martin? Hello. I'm here. You stayed friends throughout a long period of history and in which you all became such extraordinarily successful people. And that just two years ago, 
there was um, an exhibition of photographs because you were engaged um, for a few years to Angela Gorgas, the photographer, um, who was a, a friend of you all, I think. We've got some of the pictures from the National Portrait Gallery ex exhibition uh, here. Here is one with Angela and Hitch. In this photograph, we see Angela Gorgas living up to her nickname of Angela, sorry, Gorgeous, and Chris <laughs> too looking handsomer than any man has the right to be, with a baguette in his top pocket um, <laughs> instead of a fountain <laughs> pen. And a the next picture is called Hitch and is a, um, is, is a portrait, I think. And there he, he is absurdly handsome, and the hair on his chest has actually grown up to his throat now. Um, <laughs> You could have a long lunch with Hitch, which would turn into a long dinner. And then, as you went to bed at 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, reconciled to a hangover that would last a half a week, um, you'd wake up and, with a groan 12 hours later and find that Hitch had written two 3,000-word pieces about John Locke and John Stuart Mill. Um, <laughs> this was one of the most galling things about him. <laughs> He could hold his drink, and sometimes he'd stay up all night and then go into a TV program with Germaine Greer and Norman Mailer. But it wasn't on that occasion that he staggered up to Norman Mailer, uh, and in his own description, stinking drunk he was, Hitch. Um, he said he went lurching and burping up to Norman Mailer and said, I read that interview where you said that, that uh, I and Martin Amos and Ian Hamilton form a homosexual clique in the London literary world. And he said, and I just want you to know that I think that's very unfair to Ian Hamilton. <laughs> um, and then he went lurching, burping off, thinking that didn't turn out quite as I wanted it to. <laughs> well, of course, there is, there is the eternal mystery, which will join the mysteries that Thomas Brown mentioned in, uh, you know, that we will never know what name Achilles took when he went among women, and we will never know the song the sirens sang, and we will never know the names of the two men in the Conservative government whom um, Hitchens bedded when he was a young undergraduate. But um, I, I don't expect you to give the game away, but it's an intriguing game that will be played forever. But you can see why they bedded him, because he was a, ra a, rather a beauty. <laughs> and the other picture here, again with cigarette, but most surprisingly with a brace of pheasants. And it's entitled, uh, of all things, Hitch on the Rothschild estate. <laughs> we, we agreed that um, the idea that the Bollinger Bolshevik was um, <laughs> inherently hypocritical had to be kicked out. Um, why, should, why should only right-wing people be able to enjoy champagne? Um, and, and Christopher very much relished um, the high and the low. But I would like to tell this little story about, um, I think shows how he felt about class. We were in a restaurant, a tiny restaurant. There were two elegant, um, decadent young men, interminably and unignorably badgering the staff to rearrange the tables to, um, so that they could accommodate the large party they accepted. We were middle bohemian. They were minor gentry, I would say, and they had that that look of those of people who, who await with epic calm the deaths of elderly relatives. <laughs> and uh, one of these young men came up and swooped, <laughs> swooped down in an elegant crouch uh, in front of Christopher and me. And he was obviously going to ask us to move tables. And he pouted up through his fringe um, and said, after a flirtatious pause, you're going to hate us for this. And Christopher said, we hate you already. <laughs> it's wonderful of you to have joined us. Martin Amos, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> Magnificent. <laughs> I want to end by thanking all the contributors from around, um, uh, from Los Angeles, our short glimpse of Sean Penn and his cigarette and, um, and, and all of Christopher's friends for Richard for, to, who took a train from Sheffield, I believe, where you were, um, just to be here tonight. And for all of you for coming, even though you knew that the real hero was not going to be present. I did speak to him on the telephone before I came on stage. His voice was hoarse, but um, excited. He is 
thrilled that this evening ha it happened. Um, and I know that on behalf of, of, of him and his wife, he would want me to thank you all very warmly for coming and for allowing us to have, it's not really the kind of thing I do very well, this kind of television presentation and speaking to delayed satellites, but you've all been unbelievably kind and supportive. And um, thank you very much indeed, is all I can say on behalf of us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.